Jennifer there for the introduction. Thank you all for being here. I'm Amory Sievertson, as she said. I'm one of the producers of Modern Love, the podcast, and we are so very, very thrilled to be here at Work It. So thank you for that. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, Modern Love, the podcast, is a collaboration between WBUR in Boston and, of course, the New York Times. And we're very excited that we have teams from both the New York Times here, a lot of great representation from the Times, and from WBUR. So thanks to those people for being here. We're glad to have you. Um, and uh, you're going to be hearing from a couple of people involved with the podcast in addition to myself. We have the wonderful Daniel Jones. He's the editor of Modern Love. Give it up for the New York Times. We also have Iris Adler here. She's the executive producer of the podcast. So you're going to hear from both of them in just a little bit. Um, and Magna Chakrabarty is the host of our podcast. She couldn't be here tonight, but she is just going to be incredibly pumped when I come back and tell her about this room full of women innovating in audio and, uh, and people who support women innovating in audio. So I think just the fact that a, a festival of women podcasters exists is a very encouraging and exciting fact. So big thanks to WNYC for putting this together and for including us. Um, yeah. So I want to introduce the gentleman to my right here. This is John Parati. He's another producer of the podcast. He's going to be live mixing and, and doing all of the sound design for you tonight because we're going to start now with one of three live performances that you're going to see from Modern Love. Um, so I want to welcome in Lauren Molina now. So I want to brag about Lauren for just a minute here. She made her Broadway debut in 2005 in the revival of Sweeney Todd. If anyone saw that, this was this incredible version where the actors were also playing the instruments. So not only was she playing Joanna, she was playing the cello playing Joanna. <laughs> Yeah. Um, she's performed extensively on and off Broadway. She's also part of the, she's one half of this great comedy duo called The Skivvies, and, um, which is what it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> and right now she's going to be reading Rosemary Counter's Modern Love essay for you called A Craigslist Missed Connection Lure. A decade ago, before Twitter and Instagram and when Facebook was still in its infancy, my university friends and I spent many hours lurking in Craigslist's Missed Connection section, sipping cheap rosé while perusing posts and laughing at the desperate souls who loitered there. The more pathetic the ads, the better. You, Asian in green toque. Me, skinny jeans reading. Wanted to say I liked your smile, but you got off at Eglinton. Perhaps it was a fluke, or maybe our habit made what happened inevitable. But one night, my friend Kate saw an ad that read, You were at the Drake Hotel, slim with red hair in a black satin top. I didn't say hi because you were dancing with your friends. I've never done this before, but I thought, hey, it's worth a shot. This is you! She squealed. This is seriously actually you. In those days, I was red-haired, and that night my friends and I, me in a black top, had indeed been sipping mojitos at the Drake, celebrating a birthday in an intimate group that, yes, might have been intimidating to a guy wanting to approach one of us. Despite how I had mocked those who posted on missed connections, I needed no convincing to reply. So this is random, I wrote, but I think I might be the girl you saw. He answered within the hour, shocked his post had found me, if I was, in fact, the woman he saw. After some witty banter, I sent him a photo. It's you, he wrote. I can't believe it's really you. At my request, he sent me a photo of himself, crooked smile and droopy-eyed with cropped hair, I'm not very photogenic, he said, with charming self-deprecation. It all felt so sweet, strange, and surreal, and impossibly romantic. On our first date, he drove all the way downtown to pick me up for an early dinner. It was his pleasure, he explained, as he was dropping his brother off at the airport anyway. Family is the most important thing to me. 
he said over a bottle of red wine in a candlelit cafe. I know I'm not supposed to say this already, but I'm so ready to settle down. I just need the right girl. We bundled up and walked to the movie theater for a late screening, stopping at a cash machine along the way. This is my treat, he said. Something he would announce proudly and often in the days to come. When a young man passing by eyed us up and down, he wrapped his arm around my waist and said, he's wondering what a girl like you is doing with someone like me. On the way home, he stopped at a vendor and bought me blue carnations. I had been burned so many times, I knew better than to get my hopes up about this leading anywhere. I almost prided myself on being jaded, on being immune to disappointment. But the next morning, he called to ask me out to breakfast. I took the whole day off work, he said, because I can. We went for breakfast, and then, because I didn't have the luxury of skipping my waitress shift, he drove me to work. Do you need a drive home later, he asked. Nobody had ever picked me up or cared how I'd get home, so I happily accepted. Over the next week, whenever I needed to go anywhere, he wanted to keep me company. He always had something special in mind, a restaurant reservation or tickets already purchased. One night, I mentioned I'd be missing America's next top model, and the next day, he delivered me the whole boxed set. It was how I imagined how love was supposed to be. We were spending every free moment together. While other connections had felt forced, this was the twist of fate I had been waiting for. Although I was blissfully happy being spoiled and adored, my new life with my missed connection made me wonder how brutally fickle chance could be. What if Kate hadn't clicked on his ad that night? What if he had been too shy to post it? What if fate hadn't intervened and we had never met at all? And what if the universe, as quickly as it had given him to me, snatched him back? I posed questions like these to Kate and nearly everyone I knew, making me insufferable, I'm sure. And then 10, ten days into the best relationship I'd ever had, Nonstop romance, presents, cuddling. Kate appeared unannounced at my doorstep. She hadn't seen me much recently, as bad friends like me often disappear when consumed with a new man, and she had a bad feeling. I had a bad feeling too, but mostly about her, imagining that she felt jealous, possessive, and alone. Chance had favored me, but not her, though I smugly assured her that someday that would change, change if only she believed. Something had shifted in me when my silly fantasies turned real, and if there were any red flags, I refused to see them. So Kate pointed them out. Why, for example, didn't I know more about his life, despite having spent a solid week together? Because he was such a good listener that I did most of the talking. Why had I never been to his house? Because he lives way uptown and I don't drive. Why the disproportionate number of presents? Because he's the most generous man I've ever met. Why were we going on three dates a day? Because I was finally getting the attention I deserved. In any case, I cut a deal with Kate and agreed to call and press him ever so gently. On my flip phone from a parking lot, I said, my friend is probably totally crazy, <laughs> but um, is there anything you should tell me? Normally the strong, silent type, he burst into tears. Oh, oh God. It was almost as if he had been waiting to confess, this moment a release he had been anticipating. He was married, of course, and under a lot of pressure. He had one child already and another on the way. He didn't have a brother. It was his wife he dropped off at the airport. She and their child had gone to visit family and would be back in a few days. And the clincher? Though he had heard good things about it, he had never been to the Drake Hotel. He did, however, truly like redheads. I chose you, he said. You were special. 
but he hadn't chosen me. He laid a trap for women with red hair and black tops, and I was the one who walked into it. Chance hadn't favored me, it had targeted me, tapping something in me that was dormant but susceptible to romantic delusion. After all, long before he placed his ad, I had been loitering on Craigslist, mocking people who I thought were lonely and needy and nothing like me. But they were everything like me. We were all hoping love wouldn't miss us. We were all eager to believe that love for us was meant to be. After our 10 intense days together, my missed connection disappeared as quickly as he had arrived, timed almost to the day of his wife's return. I imagined him picking her up at the airport with a bouquet of blue carnations, or some special present with a secret meaning only they would understand. Or maybe he didn't do things like that for her anymore. For a long time, I considered sending her an email, possibly anonymously, but decided against it. I didn't know her or what she might do. Those rambunctious evenings of Rosé and Craigslist stalking are long gone. But sometimes I type the name of my missed connection into Google, and there he is easily found now on nearly every social media platform, smiling wide with his arms crossed or tweeting about his life's minute details. Everything I needed to know is right there, a decade too late. Meanwhile, he and his wife have divorced. They weren't meant to be either, apparently. One thing I do know, meant to be is just a fairy tale we tell ourselves. Sometimes, it's even an ad on Craigslist. Thank you so much, Lauren. So you can see Lauren next. She's next uh, month, I believe. She's going to be performing off-Broadway. The show is called Sex Tips for a Straight Woman from a Gay Man. <laughs> um, so thank you so much, Lauren. Beautifully done. Uh, if you've been subscribed to the podcast from the very beginning, you might know that Lauren was our very first episode of the podcast, and we were very thrilled to have her here to do this live for you here tonight. Uh, but one of the great things about Modern Love, the column itself, is that it brings us all of these stories of different kinds of love, right? So you've got the romantic love, um, you've got friendship, and then you have family love. So this next piece pertains to that. This is a story about a new mother. Um, who starts confronting just some of those unpredictable, really difficult challenges of parenthood before she's even brought her daughter home. So here to read this one is Amira Van. She's going to be coming out for us. Um, she stars as Miss Ernestine in the WGN America uh, series Underground, which just got picked up for a second season, so that's very exciting. Um, she's also appeared in HBO's uh, Girls and uh, the Amazon series Mozart in the Jungle. So please welcome Amira Van reading Elizabeth Fitzsimons essay, My First Lesson in Motherhood. I saw the scar the first time I changed Natalie's diaper. Just an hour after the orphanage director handed her to me in a hotel banquet room in Nanchang, a provincial capital in southeastern China. Despite the high heat and humidity, her caretakers had dressed her in two layers, and as I peeled back her sweaty clothes, I found the worst diaper rash I'd ever seen, and a two-inch scar at the base of her spine cutting through the red bumps and peeling skin. The next day, when the Chinese government would complete the adoption, was also Natalie's first birthday. We had a party for her that night, attended by families we'd met and representatives of the adoption agency, and Natalie licked cake frosting from my finger. But we worried about a rattle in her chest, and there was the scar. So afterward, my husband Matt asked our adoption agency to send the doctor. We had other concerns too. Natalie was thin and pale and couldn't sit up or hold a bottle. She had only two teeth, barely any hair, and wouldn't smile. 
but I had anticipated such things. My sister and two brothers were adopted from Nicaragua, the boys as infants, and when they came home, there were smelly, scabies-covered babies who could barely hold their heads up. Yet those problems soon disappeared. I believed Natalie would be fine, too. There was clearly a light on behind those big, dark eyes. She rested her head against my chest in a baby carrier and would stare up at my face, her lips parting as she leaned back, as if she knew she was now safe. She would be our first child. We had set our hearts on adopting a baby girl from China years before when I was reporting a newspaper story about a local mayor's return home with her new Chinese daughter. Adopting would come later, we thought, after I became pregnant. But I didn't become pregnant. And after two years of trying, I was tired of feeling hopeless, of trudging down this path not knowing how it would end. I did know, however, how adopting would end, with a baby. So we'd go to China first, and then try to have a biological child. We embarked on a process lasting months of preparing our application and opening our life to scrutiny, until one day we had a picture of our daughter on our refrigerator. 14 months after deciding to adopt, we were in China. And now we were in a hospital room with a Chinese doctor, an older man who spoke broken English. After listening to Natalie's chest, he said she had bronchitis. Then he turned her over and looked at her scar. He suspected she had a tumor removed and wondered aloud if she had spina bifida before finally saying that she would need to be seen at a hospital. Two taxis took us all there. And as we waited to hear news, I tried to think positive thoughts of the room we had painted for Natalie in light yellow and the crib with Winnie the Pooh sheets. But my mind shifted when I saw one of the women from the agency in a heated exchange in Chinese with the doctors, then with someone on her cell phone. We pleaded with her for information. A CT scan confirmed there had been a tumor that someone somewhere had removed. It had been a sloppy job. Nerves were damaged, and as Natalie grew, her condition would worsen, eventually leaving her paralyzed from the waist down. Yes, she had a form of spina bifida, as well as a cyst on her spine. I looked at my husband in shock, waiting for him to tell me that I had misunderstood everything, but he only shook his head. I held on to him and cried into his chest, Angry that creating a family seemed so impossible for us, and that life had already been so difficult for Natalie. Back at the hotel, we hounded the woman from the agency. Why wasn't this in her medical report? How could a scar that size not be noticed? It was two inches long, for God's sake. They shook their heads, shrugged, apologized, and then they offered a way to make it better. In cases like these, we can make a rematch with another baby, the one in charge said. The rest of the process would be expediated and we would go home on schedule. We would simply leave with a different girl. Months before, we had been presented with forms asking which disabilities would be acceptable in a prospective adoptee. What, in other words, did we think we could handle? HIV, hepatitis, blindness, we checked off a few mild problems that we knew could be swiftly corrected with proper medical care. As Matt had written on our application, this will be our first child, and we feel we would need more experience to handle anything more serious. Now, we faced surgeries, wheelchairs, colostomy bags. I envisioned our home in San Diego with ramps leading to the doors. I saw our lives as being utterly devoted to her care. How would we ever manage? Yet how could we leave her? Had I given birth to a child with these conditions, I wouldn't have left her in the hospital. Though a friend would later say, well, that's different. It wasn't to me. I pictured myself boarding the plane with some faceless replacement child and then explaining to friends and family that oh, she wasn't Natalie, 
that we had left Natalie in China because she was too damaged, that the deal had been a healthy baby and she wasn't. How would I face myself? How would I ever forget? I always wondered, I would always wonder what happened to Natalie. I knew this was my test, my life's worth distilled into a moment. I was shaking my head no before they finished explaining. We didn't want another baby. I told them we wanted our baby, the one sleeping right over there. She's our daughter, I said. We love her. We had a long, fraught night ahead, wondering how we would possibly cope. I called my mother in tears and told her the news. There was a long pause. Oh, honey. I sobbed. She waited until I caught my breath. It would be okay if you came home without her. Why are you saying that? I just wanted to absolve you. What do you want to do? I want to take my baby and get out of here, I said. Good, my mother said. Then that's what you should do. In the morning, bleary-eyed and aching, we decided we would be happy with our decision. And we did feel happy. We told ourselves that excellent medical care might mitigate some of the, her worst con afflictions. It was the best we could hope for. But within two days of returning to San Diego, before we had ever, before we had even been able to take her to the pediatrician, things took yet another alarming turn. While eating dinner in her high chair, Natalie had a seizure, where her head fell forward, then snapped back. Her eyes rolled and her legs and arms shot out ramrod straight. I pulled her from the high chair, handed her to Matt, and called 911. When the paramedics arrived, Natalie was alert and stable, but then she suffered a second seizure in the emergency room. We told the doctors when we had learned what we had learned in China and they ordered a CT scan of her brain. Hours later, one of the emergency room doctors pulled up a chair and said gravely, you must know something is wrong with her brain, right? We stared at her. Something was wrong with her brain too? in addition to everything else? Well, she told us, Natalie's brain is atrophic. I fished into my purse for a pen as she compared Natalie's condition to Down syndrome, saying that a loving home can make all the difference. It was clear, she added, that we had that kind of home. She left us and I cradled Natalie, who was knocked out from seizure medicine. Her mouth was open and I leaned down, breathing in her sweet breath that smelt like soy formula. Would we ever be able to speak to each other? Would she tell me her secrets, laugh with me? Whatever the case, I would love her and she would know it. And that would have to be enough. I thank God we hadn't left her. She was admitted to the hospital where we spent a fitful night at her bedside. In the morning, the chief of neurosurgery came in. When we asked him for news, he said, it's easier if I show you. In the radiology department screening room, pointing at the CT scan, he told us the emergency room doctor had aired. Natalie's brain wasn't atrophic. She was weak and had fallen behind developmentally, but she had hand-eye coordination and had watched him intently as he examined her. He'd need an MRI for a better diagnosis. We asked him to take images of Natalie's spine too. He returned with more remarkable news. The MRI ruled out the brain syndromes he was worried about and nothing was wrong with Natalie's spine. She did not have spina bifida. She would not become paralyzed. He couldn't believe anyone could make such a diagnosis from the poor quality of the Chinese CT film. He conceded there probably had been a tumor and that would need to be monitored, but she might be fine. The next year would tell. There would be other scares, more seizures and more physical therapy to teach her to sit, crawl, and walk. 
She took her first steps one day on the beach at 21 months, her belly full of fish tacos. Now she is nearly three, with thick brown hair, gleaming teeth, and twinkling eyes. She takes swimming lessons, goes to daycare, and insists on wearing flowered sandals to dance. I say to her, oh, Natalie, and she answers, oh, mama, and I blink back happy tears. Sometimes when I'm rocking her to sleep, I lean down and breathe in her breath, which now smells of bubblegum toothpaste and the dinner I cook for her while she sat in her high chair singing to the dog. And I am amazed that this little girl is mine. It's tempting to think that our decision was validated by the fact that everything turned out okay. But for me, that's not the point. Our decision was right because she was our daughter and we loved her. We would not have chosen the burdens we anticipated, but we are stronger than we thought. Amira Van reading Elizabeth Fitzsimons' essay, My First Lesson in Motherhood. Aren't these fun? Isn't this just fun to listen to these out loud? Um, and of course, John here is, is making all the magic happen. If you do subscribe to the podcast and you've ever loved what you've heard, music choices, you know, the timing of music, if you're a podcaster yourself and you appreciate those kinds of things, like we do sometimes when we're, when we're nerding out and we go, oh, isn't that just so satisfying how the music came up right there and then it went back down? Um, yeah, those are the types of things that you just can't explain to your significant other when you go home, because they just don't get it. They don't get what's so satisfying about that. Um, but Amir, if you want to keep up with her and with that second season of Underground, which is forthcoming, she's on Twitter at Amira Van. Van has two N's in it, so just so you know that there. But now, it's my great pleasure to introduce two people without whom this podcast really just would not be possible. We have Daniel Jones, the editor of Modern Love for the New York Times, and Iris Adler, the executive producer of the podcast. Please help me welcome them to the stage. I, for one, need to collect myself after that reading. What and me too. a space she puts us in. <laughs> I've heard it 25 times, and every time I just go there with her. So Dan is not only the editor of the column at the New York Times, he's also the creator and founder of the column and has been doing it for 12 years now. Um, and so at some point along the way, you get a phone call from a public radio station in Boston that says, hey, we love your column, and we love to do the audio version. Tell us what your reaction was. Um, yeah, well, Charlie Kravitz at WBOR just sort of called me out of the blue. I'm still not sure how you got my number, to tell you the truth. <laughs> it was on my cell phone. And he's never going to tell. <laughs> um, and he was driving, so he had to pause a few times to make turns in the call. Uh, but he just, he said, we're, we're fans of this column and we see a future in audio for these stories. And this was not, um, this was three years before the podcast actually launched. And um, there's, there's been a lot of interest in Modern Love over the years. Uh, there was a TV pilot made. There, there's, there's this constant sort of, you know, what can we do with this material that's more than it already is? Um, and none of it ever pans out. Um, so by the time Charlie called, I was flattered but pessimistic. <laughs> and my pessimism was borne out as the years passed and nothing ever developed. And, um, and then just out of the blue, um, uh, whatever log jam had been in place was broken and um, we were all systems go with this. This was just last, the middle of last summer. And, um, and, and I, you know, to WBR's credit, it was, um, I, I never feel like I can move forward in something until you figured it all out. And uh, with this team, they were like, we'll make something good. You know, we'll, we'll figure it out as we go along. And the meetings were very open. You know, what, what should we do? Uh, what should this be? And it was a lot of fun. Um, 
And the idea that we would have, um, you know, actors read these, and that how 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 would we bring the writers in, and how would we talk about them? That was just all open to discussion, and um, and it happened. I was, uh, you know, <laughs> I was sort of amazed. So let's flash forward to February 2016. <laughs> Finally, it happens, and we have our first two podcasts. One's a beautiful story of a fish dying, allegorical obviously, mm-hmm. and the other story that you heard tonight, Lauren Molina's beautiful uh, read. When you first hear them, and these are your stories, your babies that you nurtured and crafted, and you hear them in audio form, what was it like for you? Yeah, well, with, the, with these first two that, that we'd worked, you know, people had worked so hard on um, to, to really figure out what, what could be done. And uh, I mean, I was blown away. These are stories that I'm so familiar with, you know, I, I, uh, the editorial process and uh, the publication process and post-publication and all of that, I just, I get immersed in these stories and help to shape them. And um, so the, any element of surprise or drama, all of that is, is stripped away. It's, it's very hard to, to, to read them with satisfaction time, time and time again. You're, you're, you're just too exposed to what the story already is. Um, so to have these, you know, brought to life in a fresh, in a fresh way, with sort of interpreted by um, these talented actors, um, to have this this soundscaping and music, um, you know, little subtle sounds, and so I, when I'm, I'm I'm pretty you know I'm a sensitive guy I guess, but I'm also pretty desensitized to a lot of the the drama in these stories. I, I feel like I'm sort of reading them as an editor, and um, sometimes that I, I cheat myself out of. Um, the emotional content of the story in a way. And, and this process, I just felt like, um, brought it all back in spades. Like, like to hear um, Jason Alexander reading this, this story um, about uh, you know, this goldfish, but then it became a story that was a lot more than a goldfish and was really about mortality and um, Dan Barry's parents and his own battle with, with cancer. Uh, oh my God! I just it wrecked me. It really wrecked me. And and this was a, this was a, again a story that um, had held no surprises for me. <laughs> so uh, it, it just uh, it was a real treat. It's a little like when we read the column every week. We're blown away <laughs> not having that desensitization process. But but for for the listener or the reader, what do you think the difference is the experience between reading the column in the Times or experiencing it as a podcast? Um, I mean, I appreciate both for different reasons. I, 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 also, I, I really thought, um, I, I thought the, the columns written, the, the audience for the written column would become the podcast audience. Um, and I'm sure that's true to, you know, a large extent. But I have a lot of good friends who, who never read the column and, and didn't really admit that to me until the podcast came out. <laughs> And guess they're they not said, such you know, good I friends, just, right? You know, I don't, you know, I just don't, I don't read it every week, and I don't really read it at all. But I love this podcast, and uh, so, and and then um, to tell you the truth, there are a lot of people who, when we first announced the podcast, people always have something to complain about. Um, you learn that if you work at the Times for very long, and uh, so you know, we just we're, we're a receptacle of constant complaints. And I thought, like, who could ever complain about this project? Nobody could ever complain about this project. So when we first launched it, um, there were, and we had this page, and people could write comments next to it. And people were actually like writing comments, like, "Another good thing ruined." <laughs> and, I preferred and reading then, it. Why do I have to listen to it? I prefer it. reading. Can't we just read things? And, um, and I was like, this is in addition to the column. Like, read the column if you want to read the column. But this is, this is another, you know, this is a value added, you know. Um, but no, it was just the reaction of, no, I want to, I want to read the column. But I, I think there are, a lot of, there are a lot of converts. I think a lot of people, um, they didn't, the idea of hearing someone read a, a printed thing, they thought, well, that's boring, you know, that's potentially boring. Um, and there have been a lot of converts of people who say, oh, now I get it, you know, when they, when they really hear it. And in fact, some of those comments also asked us, challenged us, why 
aren't you having the writers read their own columns? We felt very strongly that, as you've seen tonight, this is an art to be able to narrate stories. And so that was part of what we felt we really needed to commit to to get the absolute best readers we could. But mm -hmm. I, I wonder what your sense is of that, Dan, having these actors read as opposed to the writers. Do you think it loses any yeah. authenticity, or is there something lost in the process? No, I thought, you know, I thought those were valid points that people were making in advance. They're saying that, like some people said, well, the charm of the column is it's all these people who, you know, 99% of them you've never heard of, and, and, and that the charm is the sort of rough edges and, and the actual voices and all of that. Um, but I, you know, so I have been um, in this writing business for 30 years now. I've been to writing conferences and bread loaf and all these places that I've sat through um, reading after reading after reading after reading by, by professional writers. And I'd say about 5% of them are really good. <laughs> and 10% um, of them are tolerable. And maybe 60% you know, put people to sleep. And these are some of the most famous writers you know, who have the most um, experience in reading before an audience. I think it's a skill. Um, it's a skill. And, and to be able to... Um, to interpret uh, what someone else has written and bring your own emotion to it and be, you know, have the experience and the talent to, to bring that to it is, uh, is evident in, in how, how, how these really pack a punch. Also, we wanted um, the whole archive to be at our disposal. And if we're going to have the writers read them who are scattered around this country um, and some of whom would not want to participate in that way and would not want to read. We wanted the whole archive to be available and, and to be able to get these people into studios and, and ha have them done that way. So that, that was part of it, but that was a minor part. It was really just wanting these powerful readings. And for those of you who may have not heard the podcast, uh, after the reading, of the column itself. Mm -hmm. We do bring the writer on, we, f we track them down, we find them, and we do a kind of, well, what's happened since? Because most of these columns are from several years ago. And it's very interesting then to hear the voice of the writer and to hear what's transpired in their lives since the column. So that's a big part of it. So your day job, though, Dan, is still to, you, you get how many requests a week? How many entries do you get people? Hoping to well, get the column gets about uh, 8,000 submissions a year, and we publish 52, and that, and that breaks down to what you are know, you one every 200 or so something. So what are you looking for? I mean, with that kind of volume, what is it that you're looking for? You, you, you can't read them, certainly, from beginning to end. You, yeah. you do a quick eyeballing and look for what? Um, here's the secret. <laughs> uh, so. Every column that piques my interest has, um, it, ha it, it, it displays sort of vulnerability and intelligence in, in almost equal measure. And um, that's a very hard balance to achieve because vulnerability is, is you know, um, is not being aware, is being weak in a certain way, is not knowing what you're doing. Um, and being willing, you know, willing to admit it. Uh, but you have to reflect on that experience with a certain intelligence where, you know, this is a smart readership, and um, they've heard all these stories in one form or another. So you have to um, make something of that experience and uh, explain it in, in, in a way and come to some sort of understanding by the end that a smart reader will read and think, oh, I, Oh, that's you know, um, that's said in a way that I didn't quite think of, or that I've been struggling with that, and I hadn't quite seen it in that way. So when a, when a, when a story really hits and does well, it has those that combination. Um, particular for for this column and in this section, um, it it has to have some. It helps if it has some contemporary angle, and if the relationship or what it's exploring really has to do with now, today. Um, and that either means it takes place now or today, or it has to do with technology, or changes in medicine, or changes in how we form families, and you know, what, what is happening now. 
any, any old great story, I'll find a way to get in um, and maybe mask by not revealing everything that had actually happened 20 years ago. Um, but it, it really helps if it's, if it's recent, got all those elements. So that means you're sending out a lot of rejection emails. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say this is a bit of a setup. Dan has shared with us some of the emails he's received from said recipients of rejection emails. And I, I can't let you go today without okay. asking you to share some of those with us. Yeah, I, um, so this, this acceptance and rejection process is all done by mail. It, it, by email, it's, um, you know, I, I'm saying no, you know, 190 times and saying yes once. So my job is really saying no all week long. It's so reading stuff and saying no nonstop. And, and I send um, a, a personalized letter to everybody, put their name on it. I, I've been on the other end of this enough where I know what it feels like to be rejected. So I've tried to be uh, kind about it and res responsible about it. Um, nevertheless, um, some people get very angry. Um, men more than women. Shocker. <laughs> um, men, te men are more surprised when they're rejected than women. Um, and they think that a mistake has been made somehow, that, um, that their piece possibly didn't earn a spot, um, that, that something had to have gone wrong. Um, so some people who get, who get angry send me emails back, very ill-advised, but I treasure them. Um, <laughs> and I have a whole folder of these. Um, I've saved some of the best ones for you. Um, so uh, I, I just have a few of these where, um, where people have said mean things. It didn't, it, it didn't hurt, though. I'm used to it. Dear editor of Modern Love, you need help. <laughs> Professional help. Journalists are having to work at Al Jazeera. Do you want that to happen to you? <laughs> it's just a ridiculous response. I mean, it's just... <laughs> so this person, the next person wrote, and this was from a guy. So was the first. And only 20% of the submissions are from men. That's the other thing. You didn't even read it, dude. <laughs> now, normally I don't, I don't respond to these, but in this case, I had read it. I'd read it actually from start to finish. And I couldn't, I couldn't not reply, so um, I replied, dude, I totally did. <laughs> <laughs> That's the bad news. I read the whole thing. Uh, and then this woman, she was kind of sweet. She wrote, Dear Mr. Jones, is there really a Mr. Jones? <laughs> the story I submitted is compelling and evokes a mountain of emotion. I'm beginning to wonder if I have to know somebody or know somebody who knows somebody. I don't know anybody. <laughs> Am I dead? <laughs> With this letter, I probably am. <laughs> so, one time I accepted someone's piece and she rejected me. Fair enough. So this woman, I'd sat on her essay for about three months. I was way behind, as I always am. And it turned out that she was conducting, she, at her job, um, she was conducting a job search and had all these applicants for the job. And so I sent an email that said, very briefly, my apologies for taking so long to, your res to respond to your submission. I'm interested in it. Is it still available? And about five minutes later, she replied, I'm sorry, the position has been filled. <laughs> Thank you for your interest. <laughs> so then I had to write her back and say, I actually wasn't applying for the position. And she wrote back a mortified email. <laughs> and we published her story. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dan, so much for the wonderful work you do at The Times and for all of your help, assistance, and guidance on the podcast. We're so grateful. Thank to you, have you. And thank process. you, WBUR, and thank you, audience. <laughs>
So I think I speak for John as well when I say that we just feel really lucky to work with these two, with everyone at the Times, they've been incredible. Everyone at WBUR has been incredible and so supportive. Everyone here has been incredible and so supportive, right on cue with a stand and a mic. Thank you so much. Um, but now I want to introduce our final reader of the night. Um, Michaela Watkins is here. She's the star of the Golden Globe nominated series, uh, Hulu series, Casual. You guys familiar with this? Get on it if you're not. Um, <laughs> she's here. You may have also seen her in, uh, I'll, let you, I'll let you clap for her, don't worry. You may have also seen her in HBO's Veep, the Amazon series Transparent. She's all over the place. Please help me welcome Michaela Watkins reading Amy Sutherland's essay, What Shamu Taught Me About a Happy Marriage. As I wash dishes at the kitchen sink, my husband paces behind me, irritated. Have you seen my keys? He snarls and huffs out a loud sigh, stomps from the room, and our dog, Dixie, at his heels, anxious over her favorite humans, upset. In the past, I would have been right behind Dixie. I would have turned off the faucet and joined the hunt while trying to soothe my husband with bromides like, don't worry, they'll turn up. But that only made him angrier, and a simple case of missing keys would soon become a full-blown, angst-ridden drama starring the two of us and our very poor, very nervous dog. Now, I focus on the wet dishes in my hand. I don't turn around. I don't say a word. I'm using a technique I learned from a dolphin trainer. I love my husband. He's well-read, he's adventurous, and does a hysterical rendition of a northern Vermont accent that still cracks me up 12 years of, after 12 years of marriage. But he also tends to be forgetful and is often tardy and mercurial. He leaves wadded tissues in his wake. He suffers from serious bouts of spousal deafness, but never fails to hear me when I mutter to myself on the other side of the house, what did you say? He'll shout. These minor annoyances are not the stuff of separation and divorce, but in some, they begin to dull my love for Scott. I wanted, needed to nudge him a little closer to perfect, to make him into a mate who might not annoy me or just annoy me a little less, a mate who would be easier to love. So, like many wives before me, I ignored a library of advice books and set up about improving him. <laughs> By nagging, of course, which only made his behavior worse, he'd drive faster instead of slower, shave less frequently, not more, and leave his reeking exercise clothes on the bedroom floor longer than ever. We went to a counselor, smooth the edges off our marriage, she didn't understand why we were there and complimented us on re repeatedly on how well we communicated. I gave up. I guess, I guess she was right. I, our union was better than most and resigned myself to stretches of slow boil resentment and occasional sarcasm. Then something magical happened. For a book I was writing about a school for exotic animal trainers, I started commuting from Maine to California where I spent my days watching students do the seemingly impossible. Teaching hyenas to pirouette on command, cougars to offer their paw for a nail clipping, and baboons to skateboard. I listened, rapt as professional trainers explained how they taught dolphins to flip and elephants to paint, and eventually it hit me that the same techniques might work on that stubborn but lovable species, the American husband. The central lesson I learned from exotic animal trainers is that I should reward behavior I like and ignore behavior I don't. After all, you don't get a sea lion to balance a ball on the end of its nose by nagging. The same goes for the American husband. Back in Maine, I began thanking Scott if he threw one dirty shirt into the hamper. If he threw two, I'd kiss him. 
Meanwhile, I would step over any soiled clothes on the floor without one sharp word. As he basked in my appreciation, the piles became smaller. I also began to analyze my husband the way trainers consider an exotic animal. Enlightened trainers learn all they can about a species, from anatomy to social structure to understand how it thinks, what it likes, dislikes, what comes easily to it, and what doesn't. For example, an elephant is a herd animal, so it responds to hierarchy. It cannot jump, but can stand on its head. It is a vegetarian. The exotic animal, known as Scott, is a loner, but an alpha male. So hierarchy matters, but being in a group doesn't so much. He has the balance of a gymnast, but moves slowly, especially when getting dressed. <laughs> Skiing comes more naturally, but being on time doesn't. He's an omnivore and what a trainer would call food-driven. <laughs> Once I started thinking this way, I, I couldn't stop. At the school in California, I'd be scribbling notes on how to walk an emu or have a wolf accept you as a pack member, but I'd be thinking, I can't wait to try this on Scott. <laughs> a dolphin trainer introduced me to least reinforcing syndrome, LRS, least reinforcing syndrome. When a dolphin does something wrong, the trainer does not respond in any way. He stands still for a few beats, careful not to look at the dolphin, and then returns to work. The idea is that any response, positive or negative, uh, fuels behavior. If a behavior provokes no response, it typically dies away. In the margins of my notes, I wrote, try on Scott. It was only a matter of time before he was again tearing around the house, searching for his keys, at which point I said nothing, and I kept at what I was doing. It took a lot of discipline to maintain my calm, but results were immediate and stunning. <laughs> his temper fell far shy of its usual pitch and then waned like a fast-moving storm. I felt as if I should just throw him a mackerel. <laughs> Now he's at it again. I hear him banging a closet door shut, rustling through papers on a chest in the front hall, thumping upstairs. At the sink, I hold steady. Then, sure enough, all goes quiet. A moment later, he walks in the kitchen, keys in hand, and says calmly, found them. <laughs> Without turning, I call out, great, see you later. Off he goes with our much calmed pup. After two years of ex exotic animal training, my marriage is far smoother, my husband much easier to love. I used to take his faults personally. His dirty clothes on the floor were an affront, a symbol of how he didn't care enough about me. But thinking of my husband as an exotic species gave me the distance I needed to consider our, our differences more objectively. I adopted the trainer's motto, it's never the animal's fault. When my training attempts failed, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't blame Scott. Rather, I brainstormed new strategies. I dissected my own behavior, considered how my actions might inadvertently fuel his. I also accepted that some behaviors were too entrenched, too instinctive to train away. You can't stop a badger from digging, and you can't stop my husband from losing his wallet and his keys. Professionals talk of animals that understand training so well that they eventually use it back on the trainer. My animal did the same. <laughs> when the training techniques worked so beautifully, I couldn't resist telling my husband what I was up to. He wasn't offended, he was just amused. As I explained the techniques and terminology, he just soaked it up, soaked it up. <laughs> Far more than I realized. <laughs> Last fall, firmly in middle age, I learned that I needed braces. They were not only humiliating, but also excruciating. For weeks, 
My gums, my teeth, jaw, sinuses throbbed. I complained frequently and loudly. Scott assured me that they would become, that I would become used to all the metal in my mouth. I did not. One morning, as I launched into yet another tirade about how uncomfortable I was, Scott just looked at me blankly. <laughs> he didn't say a word or acknowledge my rant in any way, not even with a nod. I quickly ran out of steam and then I walked away. <laughs> then I realized what was happening. And I turned and I, I asked, are you giving me an LRS? <laughs> Silence. <laughs> you are, aren't you? <laughs> he finally smiled, but his LRS had already done the trick. He begun to train me, the American wife. star of the Hulu series, Casual. If you haven't seen it already, you might want to see it now, huh? She's pretty good. Um, it's, it's funny because her husband is actually, he was here with her tonight. And I was thinking at one point, like, oh my god, she's nailing it. Is he going to think that she wrote this, that this is about him? <laughs> but no, it was Amy Sutherland's essay, What Shamu Taught Me About a Happy Marriage. It's actually one of the most popular modern love columns of all time. And it was one of those ones where when we read it, I knew instantly this was one that we had to adapt for the podcast, as you can see, for obvious reasons. And why you need someone like that, why you need a Michaela Watkins um, to read it. So this kind of transitions us into our next uh, portion of the evening, which we're going to keep kind of short here because we're running out of time. But we thought that uh, since some of you out there maybe already produce podcasts or are thinking of starting a podcast of your own, that we might just take some quick questions from you about how we produce this podcast, how we choose essays like Amy Sutherland's, how we pick the music, um, where, why we mix things the way that we do. So I'm going to invite Iris Adler, executive producer of the podcast, back up. We've got John Parati here as well, um, who you can, you can see and hear his work clearly. I'm going to pass this to him in case he takes some, some answers, and I'll hop over there. Um, if you have questions, I'm not sure if there are microphones out there. Are there? There's yes. One that's being passed around. There are. So there will be a microphone passed around. Um, so while that is getting in position, work up the courage to ask a question. We'd love to talk to you. There's a mic coming your way. Yeah. Hi. Um, okay. Hi. Can I, hi. Um, I'm wondering who wrote the music because we're very addicted to the music. In fact, for this particular podcast, and we listen to yeah. a lot of podcasts. Yeah. You mean the theme music? Yeah. Ah. So the theme music, <laughs> the theme music was a journey. <laughs> um, there were some of us who cared a lot about the theme music. Um, and there are others who, you know, there are plenty of great podcasts out there that don't have theme music, but I felt very strongly that we needed a good theme. Um, so we actually ended up, we went through this journey where we um, commissioned several musicians to come up with a theme, and we gave them characteristics, we gave well, them an idea. there were only two, Charlie's in the room who signs these checks, so there were only two, we don't ah, want that's it's true. It's not like we farmed it out not, to everybody, not a but series. we did give it to two different musicians. Yeah. And then what happened? And, and the results were beautiful. We just, I, we didn't, none of us had that feeling that we had nailed it, that we had modern love in musical form. Um, and so then we actually, the, the Craigslist piece that you heard, the very first piece performed, the original music at the end of that piece is what's now our modern love theme music. And we were, we were getting the, to this place where we were going to launch in like a month. We were getting frustrated. We hadn't found it. And then I'm listening back to um, a, an earlier version of the mix at one point, And I hear that music at the end and go, wait a minute. <laughs> I like this. This is good. Um, and so I, I think I quickly went into your office and said, Iris, I just want to play you something. Just listen to this. Keep an open mind. Um, and I just played the music without the mix. She said, oh, yeah, I like that. And this was from APM, which is a music uh, which library. Which is a music library that we use. It's all rights-cleared music that we use in our podcast. 
So it was sitting there all along in there. How many different music pieces do they have, John, in the APM library? 80,000? Uh, yeah, but John and Anne-Marie had picked it out for this podcast, and there it was, sitting there right before us. Yeah. Right here, yeah. Hi. Um, so first off, I agree. I think that the music is very important, and I very much appreciate your choice. I just wanted to ask about the selection process for the um, podcast. So I know at the end of each essay, it's been mentioned that the actors have a pretty big say in it. So do they generally, like, do they say, oh, like, I'm looking for this type of piece or this type of feeling? Or do they just read like stacks and stacks of essays until they find one they no. like? No, no, no. So, um, you know, we um, go through lots and lots of reads. Um, the producer of the podcast, many of them are suggested by Dan. Um, we dive into the archive ourselves. And then typically we will send an actor three, and we and and we're doing some you know some casting. We're saying this sounds like it would resonate with this actor for these particular reasons, and sometimes it works really well. They'll say yes, this one, and sometimes they'll say no, nah, I didn't really like any of these. Could you send me six more? And so we we kind of carefully curate them for the particular actor, and, and and sometimes it's a process. But we're starting with this whole sort of wealth of 8,000 and and we um, you know go through the selection process in the first cut of podcast uh, of stories that we think will work for the podcast you know for example we don't want them to be too cerebral and intellectual because it's going to make it hard to bring sound design in um, we're looking for really good narrative arcs we're looking for opportunities for sound we're looking for some movement in them, et cetera. So, so we go through a very extensive process and read lots and lots of them and then narrow it down for the actors. In the back. I'm just curious, you've spoken so much about sound design and I'm wondering in terms of sound effects and you know, backing music, how do you figure out you know, when is too much? Like at what point does it detract from the narrative and when do you know that you kind of hit that perfect sweet spot that it augments the story? <laughs> um, That's a good question. Well, I, I'm always kind of more of a less is more and, and do as little as possible and then we kind of bring it back up and knock it back down. But, you know, I don't know. Sometimes you want to hit it on the nose and that's fine and other times it's, it's just tough. Every, every single one is different, right? So if, if something feels bare once we go through it, then it's like, okay, let's start considering more music and more sound. Um, but generally, like, I, I, I still think if it stands by itself, a lot of the time, we'll just we'll let it go. You know, so it's, it's, it's a case by case. Um. But I'd also say, I mean, there are times when, okay, so for example, the mackerel and the, the dolphin sound that was there at the end. There are times where we kind of, you know, that thought comes to mind and we're like, ooh, too much? I don't know. And I tend to err on the side of, like, this is a mix. Put it in. If we, you know, we might love it. <laughs> you might put it in and we all go like, oh yeah, we love that. Stick to it. And we can always take it out if we want, you know? So I think if you have, I just have kind of through this process come up with the philosophy that try it. <laughs> you never, you might pleasantly surprise yourself or you might go like, oh yeah, no, too much. In which case, take it out. But at least you tried it because you never know what that's going to lead to. And I will say, I, John has an impeccable taste in, in music yes. and sound design. And often it might be me or Amory or one of the other producers say, you know, we know you think it's a little overly sentimental to put music at the end, but could we be a little cheesy? And <laughs> John's like, oh. I'd say uh, Iris is the queen of the heartstrings, you know? <laughs> <laughs> she knows. John's like, oh, OK. <laughs> it's a good question. Over here. Hi. Um, I've been listening since the beginning, and I just really love the podcast so much. But um, my question is about the, um, the Q&A with the original writer afterward. I noticed in the first couple of episodes, it was a a straight interview format, and it transitioned into more of sort of the writer just commenting on the piece. How did you make the decision to make that transition? Can I take this? Um, so, you know, we all are deeply embedded in public radio, and there's a very particular public radio style, 
doing two ways, um, following a story or following a piece of content. And we sort of reverted to that, like let's do just a straight interview with Meghna, the host, and the writer. And um, we found that there was some kind of discrepancy between the beautifully produced, crafted story and then this straight ahead interview. It was just too atonal, it just didn't work. And so we started experimenting by, take, by interviewing the writer um, or, or, and their significant other and Dan, who's a really key part of that, and, and playing with that sound and seeing if we could produce it more like a story, more like a narrative. And we found that to be much more satisfying, so we've, we've stuck with that format. Over here, oh, in the back. Has there ever been a writer that um, wasn't necessarily thrilled or pleased with the performance? Knock on marble, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, au contraire, you know, they're usually so thrilled. I mean, even your colleague at the New York Times, Dan, who when he heard Jason Alexander read his story, and his young daughter who was referenced in the story. I mean, they are so thrilled by the quality of these reads and that someone who is so talented is taking their writing and making it come alive. We've gotten really, really wonderful feedback. The, the day will probably come, but it hasn't arrived yet. Um, I guess I was wondering, Oh, in terms of the working with the actors, is there any kind of rehearsal that you guys do? And then also, um, in adapting the original article, how much does it change, and what kinds of changes are you making to adapt it for radio, if, that, if that's a factor? Yeah, so it doesn't change much. I mean, there, um, there are times when, and you know, Lauren might remember this from when we recorded, there are times when there's a word or something that works really well on the page that out loud, just, it's a little, um, it's a little harder for the ear to process. It's not, it's not a musical word out loud. Um, so sometimes we'll make adjustments like that. If something, if a word is just coming out kind of mumbly, we say, why don't we change it? If that doesn't feel natural, we want this, this is your interpretation. Um, but this is kind of a different setting for us because typically we're not performing live. We're in a studio and um, we, the actor has the script ahead of time, so they've probably spent a little bit of time with it. We do we usually start with just one read all the way through. And then, you know, I'm taking some notes as they're reading of things that places that we might want to pick up, or it might just be something that we want them to try reading a little bit differently. And then it's kind of up to the actor whether we just want to do some pickups, or sometimes, um, you know, people will get to the end and say, oh, let's do it all again. You know, I feel great now. So when we're doing it in the studio for the podcast, we do, we usually spend about an hour on a piece. Um, and it's really dependent upon the actor, him or herself, how she wants to kind of uh, tackle it. But so far, we've, we've been really lucky in that we've, we've found people who um, really just plug into these pieces and, and want to get them right. They're not there just to get this done and leave. So um, it's they're, in it's fact, extremely generous with their time. Yeah. You know, once you, know, you get an Emmy Rossum in the studio, you know, she'll do one and two and three takes, and we're like, great, perfect, wonderful, yeah. we got it. She's like, no, want to do it again. I mean, they are really perfectionistic, and it's been very impressive and uh, watching them work. Yeah. Yeah, I think we have time for probably just one more, and then we'll have to wrap up, so go for it. How big is the audience for, like, how many people listen to Modern Love podcast? Uh, so far, we're well over uh, a million downloads a month, and it continues to grow. And if all of you go and subscribe, it'll grow some more. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Turn them back on. If you have not subscribed already, um, please do so. We hope that, that you've gotten a good taste of these stories and how they can be transported through sound. Um, I want to really thank Lauren Molina, Amira Van, and Michaela Watkins for being here tonight and delivering these so exquisitely. Also, huge, huge shout out to the New York Times and to WBUR, again, without whom this just wouldn't exist.
And also, of course, to WNYC for putting this whole thing together, um, to everyone here who is a part of Work It. Uh, we're really, really thrilled to be here. Congratulations on the festival, and, and thank you all again. Have a good night.